like, I don't want 20. I want seven. I don't, the world doesn't need 13 spare t-shirts that are probably going to go to a local charity shop and they'll maybe end up in landfill. As a printer, we have a responsibility. Like if we're still getting paid and, mm. um, if the job's there and it's something we want to take on anyway, then as long as the as long as we get paid for our time, like why push more for someone who doesn't want more? Squeegee Inc. Podcast Season Two. This podcast is sponsored by Blind Maggot, Magna Colors, MR, Target Transfers, and Adobe Creative Suite. Hey, I'm uh, Ollie. I'm one half of Make Good Print Co. We're a screen printing studio based down in the southwest, and we print on papers and fabrics. So we're kind of a bit of both. Yes, and you're an open access, and you seem yeah, to be doing loads other, of Yeah, there's a few other strings to the bow too, but yeah, there that's the kind of headline. Um, I'm yeah. sure we'll go into the rest of it, I guess. Yeah, because I can see the cruiser. Is that the cruiser behind you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's what we've got yeah. as well. That's yeah. cool. But did you start off in the paper and then you just got asked to do textiles and that's how you kind of got sucked into that side of it? Or uh, how did it go? Yeah, I guess a little bit of that. Um, I don't think it was quite as clean cut as that. But yeah, um, I trained on a flatbread, so I'm more kind of comfortable printing on papers, or I was traditionally. Um, but when we started offering our, our services, we noticed that oftentimes when you were printing on papers, there would be like a feed in. So it might be like a fine art print for mm. a band. And then, oh, you know, hey, they also need some T-shirts. So uh, we did a little bit of merging, I guess. I don't know. It wasn't necessarily a conscious thing. But yeah, yeah we found that. And I don't know, I've been listening to a lot of your podcasts and I've been like learning, you know, I'm on a constant journey of learning. And I do notice that predominantly you're either one or the other, a lot of yes. the shops you've spoken to. Um, and I'd say perhaps that's something that's different for us. Um, yeah, I think it's kind yeah. of like a lost art though, isn't it? It's kind of like you can't really get close to the feeling of printing an art print. It's a, yeah. it's a whole different craft, and then printing a T-shirt yeah. feels a bit like a like a <laughs> like a less intense version. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the because uh, yeah. the press is doing a lot of the work for you, whereas with paper printing, there's it's like a, it's every little centimeter of the print is down to how you're printing it, and yeah. I don't know. It feels more personal, like if you, especially if you're holding the squeegee on small prints that's like all down to you on the paper yeah um, there's an intimacy yeah. yeah although like you could argue that the mistakes are less severe you know a piece of paper is worth yeah. less than a t-shirt so yeah but yeah i do know what you mean um i'm still more comfortable printing papers fine art editioning although the, they're like intense and stressful for different reasons yeah um, often, your tolerance of what is passable and what looks good and what kind of shows the nuance of a print versus someone else's could be quite different. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, when you're on like the seventh color of an eight color job and then you start noticing that the reg has gone out and you're like, oh fuck, you know, this is... Yeah, that's, that's, awesome. yeah, that's really savage. Um, I saw today this, uh, do you know Rose Stallard? She does, she does print, she runs Print Club London. Yeah, and yeah. She, yeah, so sometimes with her prints, she just like has the screen and then she like physically dollops loads of different colors of ink on. Uh -huh. And it's basically not really a screen print. I think it's called something else. Monoprint. Yeah, yeah, it's like a monoprint. Yeah. And then she just pulled it across. Yeah. And then I thought it was going to be contained in this like neat little rectangle, but then it like one of the colors just splodged underneath. And I'd be like, <laughs> oh my God, how long did that take you to do? But she's selling it as fine. Yeah. It's like, as intended but that would absolutely i'd be like oh my god i've ruined it yeah so, I know. Well, this is the creative license that mm. comes with editioning for yourself um and that's where a lot of the joy comes from and something i kind of constantly battle with is that as i've been um like refining my skills to to be more of a like a high-end editioner for other people you almost mm. like lose a lot of that i don't know the the playfulness goes because yes. you teach yourself to like reject those mistakes because they're bad. Yeah. Um, and then 
when it comes to doing it for yourself, you're you still ma- maintain that same level of like perfectionism, and it, mm. it does like really grind away at your creativity, I guess. Yeah, I understand that. I've I got I kind of got sucked into the high end art world a little bit when I worked for some galleries, yeah. and then um, I had a job once, and it was two artworks. And they were, I think they were around the 12, 14 color mark. And we okay. had two day, two days to turn it around. And, and it was like 40 or 50 of each. And also all of the colors butted up against each other. There was no stroke on them. I, I can't even explain how stressful this was. No, you can't. I mean, that sounds like purgatory. <laughs> it was purgatory. We had to even, um, oh my God, most of the time was just doing pin registration have you ever used pin registration and tabs like that like yeah not yes i've done it to kind of see if i liked it yeah you you didn't like it no it was the only way that we could consistently do it without it all rippling and going to going to pot at the end but we who's giving you a two-day day day? i mean who's agreeing to a two-day turnaround on something like that my brother (laughs) <laughs> and then he puts the stress on me. He yeah. had this huge, huge customer in this event, and then they were giving away the prince's prizes and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, she don't understand what you're asking for. We're not pressing print on a printer. Even yeah. that would be a difficult job. Yeah, like, for this. Times, right? Yeah. Uh, I know. But then again, when you when you're when you're the customer and you're the client, and it's your artwork, the freedom mm. is there. And then happy, you get the happy mistakes, and you get the yeah. cool things that you didn't expect. And totally, yeah. Yeah. Are you able to do a lot of, are you managing to put in some time for your own designs and not getting it all crowded in with clients or? Ah, it's difficult. I I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm probably making excuses. I've actually lost a lot of kind of confidence and sort of just sort of the ability to be spontaneous with my creativity, I think. like, Mm. and, And part of that is because of, you know, being busy with other people's work part of it is maybe just I think like creativity and that is a skill you know and it's a skill that you need to nurture you can't just turn it on and off like you wouldn't expect to be able to with many things you if you don't practice it you would you would assume okay I'm going to be a bit rusty and sometimes Mm -hmm. people fall into the mistake of thinking like with creativity even if you haven't done it in forever you'll be able to pick up where you left off and I well maybe some people can but for me it's definitely something I need to like nurture yeah Um, because I haven't been I um you know, I've fallen out of it a little bit. So it's something I'm trying to work on for sure. But at the moment, no, I'm not really doing my own auditioning. Yeah. Do you think it's like for artists that it's like the same for athletes? So that if you sign yourself up for like a a run, then you have to do it. So (laughs) for for an artist, if you sign yourself up to be like, I'm going to be in that show, it's the same kind of pressure. You're like, right, I have a deadline. Let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've always been better working within those type of parameters. And I've, got a background in working in agencies so when it's like a client telling you you have to or your boss telling you that they need five treatments or whatever <laughs> you know you've got no choice and you this it's amazing what like a bit of adrenaline can do for you yeah but left to your own devices or for me anyway I I get like lost in that and then I can't I kind of uh you know cramp up and I just you know freeze kind of mm. yeah maybe making your own making yourself a client for yourself yeah. Like, treating yeah, yourself yeah, yeah, as the person is, like, yeah that's yeah. really interesting yeah so yeah it's it's so different from coming out of university and I, I guess you went to uni or college or something and studied art yeah, yeah that's right yeah yeah because yeah, then you're uh, just yeah. like left alone aren't you is that where your open access side of it comes in as well yeah. well it's like I don't know it's a long yeah I guess this feeds into sort of how the business started and um I don't know I could give you the short version but or the long one, I don't know, it depends how, how bored your listeners might get. But um, yeah, I studied graphic design at Camberwell Uni and mm. I spent most of the degree in the print room. Like I got to know the technicians really well and I just, everything I could do, any project I could tailor towards print, I was doing it. Um, mm. And then when graduation came around and I realised I wasn't going to be able to continue with this and, you you know, like I totally took for granted how good those facilities were. Mm. And, uh when it when it dawns on you that you can't do that anymore we just decided like let's kind of start doing it ourselves um and that's kind of how it escalated so i guess yeah yeah it's um i don't know we 
we probably were trying to just continue being able to do whatever we wanted and yeah. we were trying to create a world and a set of facilities that could enable that and then mm -hmm. somewhere along the way like we started doing it for other people and you know then it kind of just escalated after that yeah do you ever wish to like not say anything like negative about having clients but do you think like being like an artist in your own right and like this just being your artist studio is something that you'd ever want for yourself no Hell no no, <laughs> no. <laughs> i'm not a pure i'm not a pure artist like i yeah. know people who are and i've got like so much admiration and respect for people that you know it's like a compulsion and it's not an optional thing it's like part of their heartbeat is to create um mm -hmm. and that's an amazing thing but that's not me um and I love to think sometimes that I could be that guy, but I know deep down I'm not. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not hankering after uh, just being an artist in his print studio. Yeah, I don't know why I feel like I ask you that, and I haven't asked other people because I don't know. It's just leaning towards that. The paper printing is very different from printing t-shirts. Like a lot of yeah. t-shirt printers aren't doing it as an art form; they're doing it as a means to get the design on the shirt in the yeah. best way possible instead. Yeah. Yeah, maybe mm. there's something in that. Maybe that's why the the t-shirt side of it evolved. Um, because I'm not an artist, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, I think an artist is a bit of a general term and everyone, well, not everyone, maybe, but I would still consider myself a creative, but I'm not a purist artist, you know. Mm. Um, at the moment, I'm very much focused on like the business side of things. Oh, cool. Which is okay. Quite a world for me that I'm getting my head around. Um, but that's exciting and interesting to me too. Yeah. So, like, what things are you focusing on business wise? Because I know you do events and open access. And are you teaching at the university as well? Like, yeah. Is that, like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not. Oh, yeah, not, not right now. I'm not. <laughs> I have always, historically, that's always been like a string to my bow. Um, I don't know. I'm still fig I'm fig we're figuring it out really. Um, the the print studio make good has always well, historically it was always a side hustle with mm. my wife and I both always had jobs whether that was part time or full time and the print thing was kind of happening alongside it and at various times along the way it got the proportions to, you know it, it became more of a focus or less of a focus depending on what else we had going on mm. um, it's only in the last sort of eighteen months that it's become our full time. Right thing yeah so with that there's a lot of new business to learn because i think when it was a side hustle like it it was you know I, I i still look back on it fondly but ultimately it was basically like a hobby that sometimes paid some money and mm -hmm. we didn't have to have a lot of the systems in place that we do now um and going from that to being it's you're like you're a proper business in a proper premises and you've got you know like a bit more responsibility that is a huge leap for us mm. so just simple things like our invoicing software and the website and stuff is, and yeah insurance and you know <laughs> blah 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 that kind of stuff that we never really even thought about before mm. and all of a sudden it's it, it's a thing how, how do you in, how would you encourage someone who wants to take something from a side hustle into a business do you think it's doing things like making yourself a limited company because you're saying a proper business like what is a proper business <laughs> in your circumstances like for you because it all have um, a knock-on effect doesn't it like you can't get one thing without the other and then yeah. you end up having to do loads of things all at once um <laughs> i guess like my first bit of advice would be don't listen to me <laughs> i'm not necessarily the right person to ask for me the answer to that question is like it being our full-time thing is mm psychologically huge like you could be most of the systems we've got in place and the invoicing software and the website and even the equipment and the facility could still exist as a part-time thing but i think the psychological shift for us happened when it became like this is what we do now yeah um so yeah more than any limited company or business card or email signature or whatever like i think for me the big jump was yeah making it like really basically committing you know and making mm. it like this is what i'm going to do so maybe that would be my advice to people it is um 
yeah don't get bogged down with all the administrative stuff like it's more about the psychological shift Mm. yeah no I agree because then once you find out but then like in hindsight once you find out how easy it actually is to make a limited company because it's like okay I can just do that it cost me 50 quid or something yeah like oh what other companies could I make yeah and then it's like (laughs) you've already got all the software so you can just like keep making new ones you could do one for like the, the the segment of your business that does the open access could be a different thing from events printing could be a t-shirt brand you know what i mean yeah. you can just keep on going and because you realize how easy it is but yeah. how difficult it looks on the on the outside i think yeah yeah so that's a really like interesting topic that we've definitely like gone around the houses with like do we brand ourselves as one thing or lots of things mm. uh, the other thing that goes on here that isn't even mentioned on our website is that we have artist studios above us oh, that, right. that rent from us. So we're creating a bit of an artist community. like a Brilliant. Um, And again, it was like, does that fall under the same bracket? Um, when we were redoing the website recently, one of the things I've kind of having gone through this question internally and then speaking to a lot of other people, one of the main goals was to really just like capture what it is in its Mm. purest essence and that's why on our site the first thing you see is just like a very quick sentence that just says who we are and what we do yeah and in a way that's slightly um sort of misleading because actually there's loads of other stuff going on but actually i suppose it acts as a bit of a a capture for us just to Mm. explain almost to explain it to ourselves like in a quick phrase like this is what we are and this is what yeah. we do yeah because i've kind of got that like nomad feel about you like you actually just are, like free-spirited <laughs> travelers well, yeah. who are artists as well and i love, <laughs> I love that I, I really love that hopefully yeah um but i mean i think more than that it comes from the fact that i've worked in design for a long time i've done a lot of teaching at universities as has rosie my wife um we've always had this as a side thing and now it's a full thing aside from that like I I love carpentry so there's like I've always been a bit confused basically Mm. like what Mm. am I doing and where do I want to focus my energy and yeah the moment this became the full-time thing it was like I haven't turned my back on those other things but it's like helpful to me to sort of try and articulate it to myself and to other people yeah um can i can i ask you more about like equipment and stuff because is that behind you is that a printing table for fabric yeah yardage table yeah yeah Yeah, yardage table yeah instead of a fabric printing table the yardage (laughs) table i just do you know like you just never bother to learn the whole word for it okay i've written it down now so i can't forget but can you can you explain that kind of system of registering screens for people who might not have seen one of those before oh gosh um (laughs) i can try i should also start by answering that question to say that it's rose who's the expert with the fabric um that's actually quite a relevant comment is that sort of the, the business used to be kind of like i trained and i'm more specialist in papers Rose studied fashion and textiles and is far more competent on fabrics. And then mm. somewhere along the way, we kind of like cross pollinated and taught each other. And now we're both proficient at both. Mm. Um, so I wish she was here to answer that question. But yeah, essentially, there's a registration rail along one side, which you can put, um, I don't know the technical term, like I think they're called dogs. Pins? Actually. Yeah, oh, pins dogs. or dogs. Yeah. Mm. It's sort of, and then there is a corresponding like bar on your screen. So you can knock it up against that and you do it incrementally. So each time you knock up against the same bar and you work your way along the table. And then often you'll leave a, if it's a tessellating print, for example, you'll, you'll leave every other print blank and then you mm. work because of like, you don't want to go wet on wet and the edges of the screens and stuff can interfere with each other. So you print one, every other one and then you come back and you do the odds or the evens so you then yeah. fill in the gaps yeah um, that's probably uh, a really bad explanation but yeah. i don't think so i think maybe people need to see like a, a visual of it but basically you're saying print one miss one print one miss one and then that's right yeah and then work your way back, back along filling yeah. the gaps yeah yeah i i remember taking on a job 
when I was an idiot. I'm just, I was an idiot when I started printing. And it was like, oh, wait, oh, yeah. oh my God, the shit that I used to take on. And it was this one in particular. And it was like the yellow brick road for a drama production. Uh-huh. And it must have been over 100 meters of brick pattern on yellow Whoa. felt. And oh I went, yeah, God. yeah, I can do that. I could do that. So I'm feeding it down the back of my flatbed. Uh, like a, there is yeah, like a yeah. gap. So yeah. I was printing, feeding it. And then this felt was just like filling the room because it doesn't, it's just like stiff <laughs> fabric everywhere. Yeah. I love that's that. Kind of sh- that's kind of, I, on my own as well. That's the kind of shit I used to just yeah, go. But that's, that sounds that's like a awesome. good idea. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, you're obviously not shy of a challenge. Sure. I'm more shy now because I've learned. I think I'm, I've become like a little Grinch in here. <laughs> I just. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes like naivety is bliss, isn't it? You just sort of don't know what you're getting yourself into and you say yes to things. Yeah. Um, and actually sometimes like the best things come out of that. That's almost kind of going back a little bit about, you know, this ex- like becoming an expert in your field almost hinders your sort of creativity. It's the same thing with like your ambition sometimes, like the more you know, the less you do because <laughs> mm. you realize how stupid it is. <laughs> yeah. I just thought of another stupid one that I agreed to. I on the phone, I they were talking about water slides and printing on these water slides. Uh-huh. I thought they were like children's slides, like plastic slides that you'd walk up and go down. Garden, yeah. In someone's garden. I was like Maybe if I put the screen like in the groove and then printed directly on it, it wasn't that at all. I agreed to the <laughs> job. It was water slide transfers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. seeing the difference. Yeah. Again, know nothing about it. A whole technique of something that yeah. should, an expert should do, like yeah. who does ceramics. So yeah. it just came up in my head that that's another absolute batshit thing I've agreed to do, but. Yeah. yeah. So like we've between, all been there. Yeah. Between you two, like who decides what jobs you do, or like how do you discuss um like how much time you get to get to give to like the art side or the t-shirt side, or does anything take priority? It's kind of client-led at the moment. Um it, whilst we were growing, Rose was more full-time on the business. Like I had a full-time job and then a part-time job and I was teaching quite a lot. So I would sort of jump in in evenings and weekends basically and, and the rest of the time Rose looked after everything. So, uh, I, you know, she was calling the shots. Um, more recently we had a child. So at the moment Rose is like almost full-time parenting. Mm. So kind of 90% of the time it's just me here. So I'm right. just like doing whatever what, what, whatever I'm asked to do and whatever needs doing that's how we prioritize I guess and um, but yeah it's still something that we're navigating it's like which direction we're trying to push things in and like if everything being equal and we were both here full time like what would we like what would we want to be doing and mm. that's um still the question that we're trying to answer yeah yeah so like um for people who still have the skills from like t-shirt printing, but they're thinking about getting into poster printing, for example, mm-hmm. for mainly for bands, isn't it? Like that's mm-hmm. seems to be the majority of that kind of flatbed work. That's not like the, the high end art stuff. Um, like what kind of choices can they make with paper and inks and what kind of like different uh, kit do they need to be able to get into that? Uh, what so if you've already got the fundamentals like an exposure unit and some screens and a yeah. washout booth yeah. yeah um well obviously a, a vacuum is essential i know that you can get like retrofit pallets that will fit mm. on like a riley for example that does have a vacuum so that's yeah. an option you can print with hinge clamps and so so it's not essential but i think once you've learned the basics it will quite quickly become a necessity yeah um and then ink choices, I think most people starting out would probably go down a water-based system because it doesn't require any other specialist facilities to cure the inks. Mm. Um, there's obviously a whole world within both, like you can use water-based or you can use UV or oil-based. And within all of those things, there's multiple options. But I would probably say water-based is most likely the direction you want to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, considerations like any paper. Brands, sorry, any brands on the inks that you like? 
Uh, I've tried like every ink yes. under the sun, I think, <laughs> with, with paper, I'd say. Yeah. Um, it does, every, all of them have got their pros and cons. Um, at the moment, well, we, we often, we, we mostly try and work with Permaset because of its eco, eco credentials. We also use Screen Tech, which is made by a company called, sorry, Aqua Art, which is made by a company called Screen yes. Um we have used Speedball in the past. We've used System 3, just mixed with their yeah. base. Um, and then you've got TW Graphics, which we also use quite often. Um, they're probably like, they're rightly regarded, I suppose, as like the market leader in water-based systems. Mm. Um, yeah, so we've got, we actually carry all of those things. We've got the full range of TW, we've got a full range of Aqua Art and um, set. um within all of those there's like binders that need to be taken into consideration additives like gloss and matting agents and flow thinners um we really like the lasco um binder it's it's a funny it's not something that many people maybe know about but it's How something are you spelling it l-a-s-c-o lasco l-a-s-c-a-u-x it's oh. a swiss company cool yeah and they make pigments, so that they predominantly make paints, basically artist paints. But they, a bit like System 3, they developed a kind of a system for making their paint, like paint, their paint pigments printable by using mm. this base. And they've actually kind of become known as well as as their inks, which are incredible, their paints, which are very strong, high-dense pigments. Their, their bases are, are really good as well. So we like to use them. But yeah, it it really like it does totally vary. And to be honest, I sound like I know what I'm talking about, but a lot of the time it's a minefield and you're still figuring it out. Mm. Well, one guy that I I love on Instagram, he I think he now is what using speedball, but like was just using household paint, <laughs> which is <was laughs> awesome. And it just shows you can do it. Like you can do whatever you want. Um there are no rules, but I think when you start auditioning for artists and it's got to have like certain qualities and it's got to have a hold fast likeness and it won't fade in the sun and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, you get down, you go down some rabbit holes. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you about that, those qualities. Like archival quality is probably, is that what you're referring to with like, how yeah. do you, like which eggs are saying that you can use them and their archival quality. Like, I'm not sure which ones actually say that or if they're yeah. all trying to say that they are. I think probably, I don't know for sure. There will be people out here that will be like scoffing at my response, but I think probably most, more often than not, if you're going with archival, you're probably using an oil-based or a UV-based ink, mm. um, which, yeah, they're just stronger, scratch-resistant, like last infinitely. But... Yeah, I don't think there is an accreditation. I don't okay. think there's not in the same way that you have GOTS or PETA mm. certified, like Soil Association certified, those kind of bodies that give certifications. I don't think there's one for, for inks that say this is archival quality. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a kind of grey area, I guess. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because like with yeah. T-shirts, you know you've done a good job if it doesn't wash out, but with an art print, you're like, it looks good. Yeah. Is it good? Like, I'm, I'm always, I feel like I've done a good job if it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, my, yeah. that's my goal, yeah. And then can you tell, like, favourite papers? Because papers is a whole genre. It's like there's as many T-shirt brands as there are paper brands. Like, oh, no. What, what would you go for if, if um, it was, like, your choice? If I was, like, our house stock is probably something like a Naturalis, which is a, a paper made by GF Smith. mm Oh, there's a comp there's another range called the Mohawk. Both of those, Naturalis and Mohawk, come in like a variety of thicknesses, finishes, and some are like higher range, like quality like in, for example, in the Mohawk, you can get like Mohawk every day and then Mohawk fine. Um beyond that, and that oh, both of those papers come from GF Smith. They also stock the color plan, which is a very popular mm. paper for screen printers. Um another great paper merchant which is just super fun to go and visit if you ever I know, have, I is, know. Uh, uh, John Purcell papers in London I've tried they to are, explain this to people it's like a kind of like treasure trove like in a Harry yeah. Potter film isn't it it's yeah. like 
this yeah, is really it's fun. unreal. It feels like you've gone back into. I always think of like, yeah, exactly that. You just think if like one of our kind of American counterparts came to John Purcell paper, they would just think like they're in a film about Victorian England or something. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just a cool place and they'll help you out massively. There's like, you get, you, you got your Somerset satin range and your Somerset tub range and that kind of mm. stuff. So yeah, there's a million options and it really does depend on like the weight is a big factor, how many layers you're putting down, you know, like obviously if you think of a piece of paper, like a sponge, like it will absorb paper and then it will expand and contract and ripple, especially yeah. if you're printing with water-based inks. So, mm. you know, a general rule of thumb is if you're printing loads of layers, you need a thicker paper. Not always the case, but it's a good starting point. Um, yeah. You, and then, you also mentioned tub size there. Like, can you explain that to people? Do you like, is that where they wet the paper and then dried it and then wet it and dried it or something? I don't know. Um, <laughs> is it something know. like that? I, yeah. I just remember having to go to that once because they were asking me on the phone, like, oh, so like how much of the of the paper surface is actually going to have ink on it? And I was like, 95. And they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you need the size, I think sized paper. I wish I knew more about it as well. I think that is where it can take loads of ink and it doesn't yeah. ripple. Yeah. To, but yeah, I need That's to look cool. at it as well. There's cool workarounds. If you're doing like smaller runs, some I've heard of some people that, for example, print an open screen of just like clear base on the back of the paper. Wow, that's clever. And then rack them all up like the day before, let that kind of absorb, and it that will like any kind of reactions that might happen will, will have happened then. And then when you print on the top side, it won't like you know go funny as much. That's so cool. I've never thought of that. That's really yeah. good. Mm. I mean, that obviously doubles your work in some respects, but if it saves registration problems later down the line, then it's worth it. And um, and then like acclimatizing the paper is a big one like put it, racking it in your room before you print like a couple of days before just so it can absorb any more like ambient room moisture so there's things like that um but yeah we've we've definitely come into some like you know it's a minefield and it can throw some challenges along the way yeah um like how do you treat things like uh, i understand that you are a graphic designer but like how have you got into like the areas of um, screen printing, like to do with like half tones and how are you, what programs are you using to do your separations and vectors or raster based or like what kind of thing? You yeah. Uh, good questions. Um, it's mostly, yeah, it comes from my training and background as a designer. So I was always fairly confident and proficient with like illustrator and, uh, and Photoshop. So when it comes to, whether it's paper or fabric, most, you know, nine times out of 10, it would have gone through one of those processes because, you know, most of the time clients don't provide the artwork exactly how you want them to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with papers, so with, with fabrics, it's like, like your place, we're more often than not, we're working with vectors and yeah. solid colors. Um, I don't, I've never done a SIM process. I've done a few half tone like CMYK separations. Oh, this is on fabric. Fabrics, yeah, t-shirts yeah. and stuff. Yeah. On t-shirts and tote bags. Whenever we've done multiple color jobs on fabrics, we've mostly worked with vectors. Um, so there'll be yeah, Illustrator to yeah. work with them initially. Um, and then either separate them out ourselves into layers and adding trapping and whatever, or we might run it through um separation studio mm. which i learned through you which is oh. like <laughs> i heard you talking to one of your other guests i think it was um oh, who was it maybe humane made yeah and just explaining like the set process and it was just like yeah that light bulb moment for me happened too it was just like fucking hell like this is insane. <laughs> i don't have to do this myself yeah. i know i know so, yeah is. that's a great one and then when it's paper it I would I don't know if I wouldn't trust it. I feel that maybe it just requires a little bit more of a delicate touch. And I, maybe I just need to know what's happened to that artwork before it's gone on press. Mm. Um so I would still do those steps myself. I weirdly would as well, but why? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't know. why not? I think I think I would 
And now I want Maybe to try. Maybe we should try it out. Just do yeah. one. Yeah. We'll both try it and then realize together, oh my God, art printers have not had separation studio. Yeah. And we're blowing their moment. minds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe there's like tolerances are different and uh, yeah. Although you can do, I, I haven't, I'm yet to fully explore separation studio, but I know, you, you know, it's still pretty ad- adaptable what you can do with it. But mm. I just feel like maybe I need like total control when I'm doing a paper print. So, oh, well, you know, oftentimes you can spend almost as long on the computer as you can on the print bed when it's, when it's a, you know, a detailed art yeah. print. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a really cool video that I want to ask you about. It's that um, color shifting top layer you did on one of your invites where you brought uh-huh. it out into the light. Can yeah, you tell yeah. us, like, did you come up with that? Did the customer, or like, how did how we did you guide them to go? Actually, that is a reality that we can make that happen. It was yeah, it was a totally collaborative thing. They came to us with a challenge. They sort of had an idea, but didn't know if it was possible. And it could have been like holographic or glow in the dark or whatever. It wasn't specifically like it's got to be this. And then through conversations and research and speaking to ink suppliers, figuring out what we could actually do, we kind of narrowed it down to that being a good outcome. And it, yeah, it was, it was a great project, although it was quite stressful. I remember, I remember it really clearly going back to when I was like full-time, part-time, blah, blah, blah. This was like a, a classic situation where like the deadline's Monday and we're printing on Sunday afternoon and it's going wrong. And I'm like, (laughs) like come tomorrow morning, I've got to be back at my day job. Like we have to resolve this now. Um, It all came together amazingly in the end, but yeah, it was a a difficult one. So can you explain to people who haven't seen the video, like what actually happens when you bring it out into the sunlight and stuff? Yes. Okay. It was a digital print that was, provided to us so we didn't oh. source that side of it um we were given a digital a set a batch of invites that had been printed digitally i think on an indigo press which is pretty cool um they we made sure that they were all very carefully registered and cropped so that they all had a, the same lay edge so that we didn't have any registration problems um and then we added a screen printed layer on top which is a photochromatic ink so mm. it's essentially invisible so printing it was really hard, knowing whether we'd done a good enough job or not. Yeah, that's I true. I can't even see. We were like, fuck. <laughs> we're like, is that good enough? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so every now and then we'd like kind of get our torches out and like really inspect it. Um, yeah, so photochromatic ink that's invisible to the naked eye um, in its like unlit form. But then when it's exposed to sunlight, it kind of pops. It's a bit like, do you remember... Um, with like old cereal packets where they used to get the, do you remember those plastic spoons? Yes. You where you put yeah. them in the mouth and then they change colour. Or yes. like the t-shirts. I think, was it like, like Fat Willies or whatever, when you blew on them and they changed. The American, do, does everyone know what Fat Willies is in America? I don't know. But those were, about it. Oh God, they were, they were amazing. So yeah, same oh, principle. Oh, sorry, yes. No, I understand what you mean. The surf yeah. brand. And they always yeah. had long sleeve t-shirts and they were always like brightly coloured. Yeah, and there was one where like you would breathe on the fabric and it would change colour. It's like a heat yeah. map, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's the same technology, but yeah. So the the and and the reason for all of this was that the invite was for an event that was all like sensory and very exclusive and VIP, and the idea was that you didn't know where you were going and it, they were going to renounce the like location at the last minute and all this kind of stuff. So they were trying to kind of bring those ideas and themes into life in the physical invite so yeah. you open this invite and it was like nothing and you're like great like what does that tell me <laughs> and then you would tick it in the sunlight and it would reveal itself um yeah it was a super it's, cool it's really it, it does yeah. look really cool and it doesn't just like reveal as soon as it goes out in the light does it it kind of appears over like maybe 20 30 seconds but yeah yeah and then it disappears again when it goes back in the invite which is yeah 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 i've seen that with uh i went to magna colors and they had that ink Mm -hmm. on the swatch and again it was like oh this one's really unimpressive but wait until you wait until the end of the tour when you walk outside with it and it is cool i wish like more customers I don't know, gave more like freedom with t-shirts and things because like yeah. those kind of ideas are a little bit more, 
yeah, they're just more fun, aren't they? And you get to use them. Like, yeah, we're, we're really trying to. Maybe we're not even, maybe it's happening actually. I don't know whether we're slowly building a bit of a name for ourselves in that field, but recently we've certainly been getting some like slightly less mainstream requests. And it's, oh, cool. it's a bit of a headache, but it's actually so much more. For me, it's like the problem solving aspect of it is super fun. And um, yeah, I think it, it's also like generally smaller quantities, but with a bit more like love and care that's gone into them. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you do your own wedding invites? We did do our own wedding Well done. Good, yeah. good, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well disappointed. Really? No. Yeah, which was like a kind of, what's the word? Like a keepsake or something that you give. Yeah, a favour. A favour. So instead of like... Um, almonds. What, <laughs> yeah, instead of almonds or I don't know what other things you get. But we did napkins. So we printed these big like tea towels that would were useful on the day but then people also took away with them which is cool so now sometimes when we go around like friends houses and they're doing the washing up they're using our tea towel which is kind of nice (laughs) yeah yeah no it's so cool to be able to like print your own invites and stuff um yeah yeah and just adding wedding onto anything makes it more expensive so bringing it (laughs) in-house it's good yeah yeah um can i can i ask how is say if someone is from t-shirts into like the art print world and it goes into invites and things how are you pricing that differently for a price per print because that's something i struggled with with t-shirts because there's Mm. a set price per color per design but with fabrics and things there's so many variables i can't do a flat rate for printing because it's not even that the paper's changing it's like the time of printing an edition of 50 on the flatbed is is just nowhere near printing t-shirts like yeah. Are you finding that or how are you figuring that out? I'd love you to answer that question too. Cause like, we, okay. yeah, like everyone has their own method of pricing. Right. And it's, it's a bit of a dark art. Um, and we're something we we've just relaunched our website and we've published like a pricing section and we're trying to be like completely transparent about the upfront costs and like basically what you can expect. Um, but it's taking us, and it continues to take a long time just to like figure that kind of stuff out. Um, I think one method people use is they just sort of, they sum up all of the raw material. Well, this would be the same whether it was mm. or, or yeah. paper. They, they sum up the, the raw material costs, e.g. what it's going to cost them. And then they just add time. And that's like a calculation depending on the complexity of the job. There's that way of doing it or there's things like you can try and really like delve into like specifically like how long would it take me to pull this squeegee and then move the carousel or take the t-shirt off and then put it on again and and how how does that multiply when you're doing different layers because it's obviously not it's not double so for example on a carousel if you're doing a two-color job and a one-color job the two-color job doesn't take twice as long as the one color no. So it's, it's not a simply a case of just doubling it. It's like you've got to quantify like the percentage increase. Whereas with paper, it kind of is double because you've you've taken that paper away from the bed, you've put it down on a drying rack, it's dried, and then you've stacked it all, and then you're basically doing it all again. So effectively, yeah. with paper per layer, it is basically double every time. Whereas with a t-shirt, assuming you're using it, yeah. yeah. I um, I kind of I kind of want to like massively disagree with the time thing because <laughs> yeah go on <laughs> because with t-shirts that makes sense in my head mm. but with the paper it's a craft that hardly anyone can do the amount of paper print like uh, you know these kind of like specialists who can do that skill mm. and it's so skilled I don't think time like how long if I give myself an hourly rate I don't think that equates. So I was doing like flat prices of, I figured out like prices of single color, two color, three color, four color, five color. And then they were astronomically more than a t-shirt print. I don't know. I I, I can't really tell. I also just looked around at other studios and actually put in a full, like got a brief from my customer, figured out the paper, the colors and all that type of thing. And then put that to other studios to price up, which I know accidentally wastes other studios times but you have to no, you have to get a basis it, for it somehow yeah, yeah. it's Who interesting knows? that's quite reassuring in a way because we're always second guessing ourselves whether we are like doing this completely wrong or uh, really expensive or 
I guess that what we've learned through the process of doing it multiple, because we, we, this is like the second or third website we've had. And each time we've always tried to have like a quote form and an online pricing system. And mm. every time we like get back out like the spreadsheets and the Excel and the calculators and go through all our like catalogs from the suppliers and then work out how much like emulsion we're using when we cope with all that kind of shit. And it's like trying to get it down to the nth degree. And then every time at a certain point where you've got it close as you can to a reasonable number, there comes a point where we just go like, that'll do. Like, yeah, there's probably some hidden costs that we didn't didn't calculate and that we're, we're making a loss on. Like we haven't factored in like how much tape we're using or, mm. but we just get to a point where we're like, oh, I can't, like, we will literally be here for a year if we try and work all of this out. Exactly. Yeah. So you have yeah. to get to the stage where you're just like, if you're happy with it, then yeah within I, you know, yeah. narrow it down to a reasonable number and then if it makes sense to you i guess it should make sense to other people that's where i was yeah and then m came on board as someone working in the business and every yeah. quote i did she went double it and i was like <laughs> i can't yeah. double it i can't double it no because the last person i charged it was this much and she was like double it and if they push back, then we'll talk about it. And I was yeah. like, I can't do it. And can't write the email. And she just bloody did it for me. Like <laughs> press, press send. Yeah. And she just completely flipped my mind on my pricing. Cause I was doing things like, oh, okay. So I'm worth this amount an hour. And I'm like, no, I'm not an employee anymore. I'm not yeah. worth anything an hour. I'm, yeah. I, I'm a skilled artisan person. Totally. Or yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, but it's yeah, all about it's valuing your craft, isn't it? Yeah, but I didn't. I, I used to just be like running around after people on open access, cleaning their screens, doing all this grunt work. And then at the end of the day, I had like 40, 50 quid. And I was like, what am I, what am I doing? Yeah. Like, Maybe we should find... get M to come and do that for us. <laughs> yeah, you just need someone who's like a little bit evil. <laughs> yeah. But maybe a little bit distance from the business at first, just to come over and go, no, guys, just... Just try it just once. Just go double it, yeah. and then see if you get any kickback. If you do, then start negotiating. But yeah, yeah, I never yeah. got any kickback on it. Just, just go for it. Interesting. Well, yeah. yeah. I reckon my, most people my are customers, if they ever listen to this, they'll be cursing you. They'll be like, ah. <laughs> I used to get it much cheaper. Uh, yeah. But I, I haven't actually even looked at your prices or anything. You might be very much in line with what mine turned out to be in the end. I don't we know. Try, but... Yeah, we did, you know, we did a lot of research. So we did our, our own calcs and mm -hmm. yeah, quantified all of the raw material costs and the prices we're getting from the suppliers. And then we added like our time and then we looked at other people's and we were like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, this is roughly the same. You like, they might've come to this number a, a very different way, but ultimately like we're landing a, in a ballpark that's the same. Yeah, I do get that. It's also like when you start t-shirt printing, I made the a bit of a mistake because I compared myself to all the automatic studios. Uh, yeah. I was like, fucking hell, they're doing it for like 120 a print for a I shirt. Know. And then I'm like, mm, okay, I'll put my pricing in there. So I'm competitive. No one's coming to me because I'm competing against them. They want me because i'm a manual screen printer in their yeah. town the amount of times that's happened yeah. to that, we've been baffled where we've been like you know going back to like trying to work this out to put on the website do the quote form all that shit and then we've we've got it and we're like right we're happy let's now compare this and then we'll look at other people and we're like the fuck like then yeah. like how are they making any money <laughs> you know yeah. it's actually like less than half and we're like oh it's because they're on an auto or like or they're they're ordering like huge volumes from their suppliers so they're getting everything like like much less corrupt than we are and you know mm. yeah it's confusing but um i guess such a minefield i try yeah. and be really transparent and i think if if you've done the diligence then it's fair to your customer like whatever number you land on it's not like you've just gone like this much and then the next person that walks in the door you say this much and you, you know you're fucking them around it's like i feel that i could if i needed to i could completely explain all of the justification so i feel like kind of good about that um, yeah funny thing no one's ever like, gonna ask you to justify no, it I know, so. but yeah it's just a it's just a conscientious thing i suppose i know i know it is, it's such a difficult topic and even like someone listening to us now thinking oh how do i do our pricing have they even learned anything off that so it's like yeah <laughs> just 
cut all that out. Next question. <laughs> Number off the top of your head and then yeah. double it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Like, anyway, oh, so tricky. Um, can you talk to me about like open access and how you how are you managing that? Because I've seen it as an option. Is it still an option? And like it's like, like a work in holders? progress. I think that you're getting, probably getting the, the theme here is like a lot of it's a work in progress. Um, is it your mate and one person's allowed in and then <laughs> no one else so allowed in? Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of a bit like that, truthfully. Like it's one one off at the moment. So it's not a friend. It doesn't have to be a mate. It doesn't have to be someone we've ever met before. But we're still figuring out like who, what level of proficiency people need to yeah. be at. Or they can come in and how that the other thing is how that works around what we're doing ourselves so mm. rather than just like diving in with this like membership scheme and then having like hundreds of people banging on the door we we're sort of trialing it by inviting people to come and use the space but managing the volume of people and the times that they're able to do that yeah and i'm actually not certain that it's gonna work like for it I'd love it to, and we're going to keep trying, but it might end up something that it might be an offering that we ultimately drop. I don't know. We'll see it, see on the uptake and the success of it for sure. Cause I do yeah. like having people in and I like giving the opportunity for other people to do it. So if we can make it work, we, we hundred percent will, but at the moment it's just a bit of an unknown quantity. Yeah. Uh, that proficiency thing is something that I've never got my head around to like when, when we yeah. had this we had this as three flatbeds at one point now they're yeah. all like we've got a flatbed in a container now but I used to have people in here and one of like one or two of them print like teach taught print at like Reading Uni or something and they're really yeah. like top artists they show in galleries yeah you're learning off them and mm. you're just helping them out in the background to coating screens or something but then you get other people who are terrorists <laughs> Every time they come in, there's still ink stains on the floor from a couple of them. Amazing. Uh, nice little memento. Oh, giant A0, beautiful 90T fresh mesh ripped with scissors because they're cutting tape with the scissors through the mesh. Oh. And you're like, how did you how yeah. did you do that? That's impressive. Yeah. Oh, this is all one person. Um and people that you know <laughs> said they know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. For us, it's also that, you know, we we addition, right? You know, we we run a a business, so we need to know that the next day we can come in and do what we need to do. And taking that story as an example, like if you came in and none of the screens were clean or half of them were busted, you'd be like, right, that sets my job back. And then that suddenly negates all of the like benefits of doing it in the first place. So mm. yeah, we're having to sort of figure out how much work we're doing and but it isn't good income stream and you've got these facilities which are mainly lay, laying idle so i can see I know, like yeah. why you want to do it it's tricky isn't it yeah it's tempting but and like i said we're not we're, we're totally still working along those lines but if it doesn't work out then that you know that will be fine as well like mm. um in a way i think a lot of this comes back to the fact that we've always had other jobs and so i've i've always taken like my creative satisfaction or my financial security or my sense of kind of development professionally from different places so yeah. like you know if i'm getting like bored as hell in my job but it's paying well and then like the printmaking wasn't making any money but it was really creative and I felt that that was a really healthy way. Of, like if all of those things have got to come from one place, then right. that's really unhealthy. And it, it quite often is the case for people that are in full-time employment. They're like, yeah, mm. they're like financially stable, but they're not satisfied. Or yeah, they feel like they're progressing and climbing a ladder, but you know, they've lost all like sense of ownership of what they're doing or, you know, whatever it is. So I, I always worked in different places to, to balance that. Mm. Um, in a way, I think, Subconsciously, I suppose I'm trying to replicate that here in that we're doing the service and we're running workshops and we're doing open access and we're doing a little bit of our own work, but we still sometimes produce and sell prints to local kind of shops. That's cool. Um, and that's maybe where it's coming from is that, yeah, like one of those things might be the bread and butter revenue stream. One of them might give me more creative satisfaction. One of them might feel like I'm yeah, benefiting the community, which is something that's important to me. Um, 
yeah, and I don't think it would be possible for all of those things necessarily to be coming from one place. Mm. It's quite nice to diversify a little bit. I really like that approach. That's that. Yeah, I understand it as well. I do get it. I mean, um, yeah, you must, right? You're doing so many things. <laughs> like, I'm like, makes me tired just thinking about what you're doing. Well, today, actually, I just walked out and uh, we just went to the local park. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we just, because I bought a drone. So we've actually oh, no. just been flying a drone around <laughs> for two hours. Yeah. Uh, this is like personalities, okay? So Em gets the drone and she's like, right, just bring it up to like a meter. It's so cool, by the way. If you've ever thought about it, just get it. <laughs> um, and then she's like carefully going up and down little circles. And I just went, whoop. And I went, whoop. And I just <laughs> sheer up into the, I couldn't even see it. And I couldn't even see the drone to bring it back. I had to press a button that says come back home. Yeah, it's got like a self-docking thing, right? That's mad. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's the it's the coolest thing I've ever bought. Yeah. And I didn't think I was materialistic, but I am now because I've got the drone. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But that must so, be a, that's a good insight. But like I'm getting the sense that you don't that those moments are few and far between, right? You must be pretty busy all the time. No, not really. No. Um, no, I've got the bread and butter jobs that you're saying, like that kind of consistent revenue stream is probably like pre-exposed screens and films. Which probably... we've used in the past, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, that's like maybe down to like two and a half days a week. Mm-hmm. And then printing for our own brand is maybe a day a week. And then the rest of the stuff is like creating videos and content. But I th- it's like... We could grow and get staff, but then we can't walk out whenever we want. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I want to. So yeah. it might well, something might materialize where we have to get staff, but um, it sounds like you're in a place where you can still control that. Because sometimes it kind of gets taken out of your hands, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's scary. So yeah, long may it last that you're in control. Yeah, I know when it's going to get taken out of our control is when we get moved out of this premises and then we go into a big one and then you've got to mm-hmm. make more money to pay the rent. Like, mm-hmm. that seems like a really big premises and you're saying that it's got all this artist studios, but like, how did you like, how did you come across this unit yeah. and like, was it, uh, were you able to like accum- acquire more of the building as it went along or do you have the whole thing? No, no it was like a huge reach and terrifying um, <laughs> um it's, it's easy to like look at and think you know they've got it sussed and look at that great space but uh, yeah we started in a room that was like the size of most people's bathrooms <laughs> in fact no we started in the landing of my rent oh my that is so good that, it wasn't even the spare room or the garage it was literally <laughs> yeah. the landing outside <laughs> the bedroom um and then we found this like section of a railway arch that was like the weirdest artist collective, but then also squatted in half the time people were living there. They had this horrible cat that used to attack you every time. You, it was just the weirdest thing. But we took a section of that and that's where we really grew the business. So, but that room was like legitimately the size of most people's bathrooms. Um and yeah, it was kind of embarrassing. Like we couldn't ever have people to come, like clients would be like, can I come and pick up my prints? And we'd be like, no. <laughs> like, the They're outside. Yeah. <laughs> the cat. No, it's fine. We'll deliver them for free. Like. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, yeah, we, as you mentioned earlier, we were like kind of nomadic in the what we, we moved out of London. We lived in a van for a while and traveled. And that, during that period, the business was basically on a hiatus. Like we put everything in storage. We used to sometimes help our existing accounts by outsourcing work to other people. So we wouldn't do the work, but we would help them find or work with people that, that could. Um, and then we relocated down to the West Country about three years ago. And that was just before COVID or kind of during COVID, really? which was the weirdest and craziest time to move. Um, yeah, it was like the it was all in motion pre-COVID. So it... A lot of people now were like, oh, yeah, you did the classic, like left London and moved to the country because of COVID. It's like, no, no. <laughs> <We're not. laughs> so but, my, my, the, yeah. my mortgage says different. Yeah. But that's the, funny. the outcome of that was that we moved to a new area without knowing anyone or having any idea of how we were like going to set up our business. And then we couldn't, it was basically illegal to socialize. Like you couldn't make friends. <laughs> yeah. you couldn't, yeah. 
kind of do anything. There was no point in setting up a business. Um, and yeah, when this place, we, we when that rule of six was happening, so for anyone, I don't know if like, yeah, I guess it was the same. I most. think they've got the same kind of thing. Rule of six is when you can meet up with it was six, six people, people. outside yeah. and yeah. I think you could buy a drink if you were eating a meal as well eat out to help us yeah that thing it was all kind of strange things going on oh my but god for us it was just this like revelation because we'd moved to a new area and it's quite rural now where we live and we hadn't we basically like, literally we hadn't met anyone for like five months and we were starting to go a little bit mad and starting to wonder, like, have we made a huge mistake? Like, <laughs> um, we left, like, London, you know, we were in Peckham, which was a hubbub of everything going on, and suddenly we are in, like, the woods, basically. Um, anyway, we came out one night to this brewery that was doing the Eat Out to Help Out thing because they had, like, a Thai food kitchen in the in the garage, like, next door, and you could buy that and then drink. And on that yard, we saw this building, and I was like, that is... Because the, they had a DJ, and there's Thai food and beer, and all of a yeah. sudden, I was like, I'm back in London. Like, this is yeah. the place and there was people out and it just felt really kind of energetic and exciting and at that point we said like if we're gonna base ourselves anywhere like this is where we need to be it's obviously a happening spot um and then yeah sure enough like a unit became available the we put our name on a waiting list and then the the management agency who were acting as estate agents as well like contacted everyone and did an open house so it wasn't like a private viewing it was like you know come between 10 and 4 yeah. You're just coughing so, on people at this point, so you're like... So yeah. <laughs> there are loads of people here, and it's a, it's a big room, it's a big building, and it's two floors, and, like, we were looking around being like, this is the absolute dream, but, mm. like, we absolutely cannot afford this. Like, what, mm. you know, why are we even here? And then a few of the people that were also viewing it, we sort of said to them, hey, like, would you be interested in... Because we never met them, but we were like, maybe we could combine, we could have the ground floor, you could have the first floor, and nothing materialized out of those conversations and we spoke to the agents and said could we just take one floor that's more than enough for us like it it was you know for us it was like we are used to working in yeah. a bathroom so we could literally have a quarter of that space and it would be enough and they were like no you've it's all or nothing like you've got to take it all and we were like holy shit so yeah we went away and thought long and hard and we decide we negotiated that would we be able to sublet basically so it was mm -hmm. never an intention we never set ourselves our sights on becoming like landlords and making this thing but we just we thought we thought maybe that would be a way of making it viable and they said yeah if, if you want to commit and you want to sign on the dotted line like we're happy to allow you to sublet mm. so we did that and and um we took it on. It was an empty shell. We we built like artist spaces upstairs, some, like partitioned it all out, built a kitchen, um, and we started advertising for spaces before we'd even built them. Like we put adverts on Gumtree and Facebook and stuff, being like, you know, artist spaces available, come and have a look. And a few people came, like were like so keen that they came the next day, and we we're there with our drills and saws and whatever. <laughs> They just were like, no, this is shit. And we were like, have a bit of imagination. <laughs> it's not going to be Good Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah. There's beer downstairs next yeah. door. Like, what else do you want? No, we were just like, obviously, this isn't finished. Like, but anyway, we managed to build enough of an interest that by the time they were ready, like three of them had already been rented. And mm. then the other two came pretty quick after that. And ultimately, they are what allow us to be here. Like, they they don't completely cover our costs, but they go a fair way to covering our costs. Yeah, it's uh, quite genius. Like, well, it's an accidental, yeah, very serendipitous, but not a plan. Um, mm. In hindsight, yeah, one of the best decisions we ever made, and not just from the financial point of view, but also, I should add that like we come to work every day and we have like having colleagues you know like we've got a shared kitchen upstairs everyone's in having their copies and having a chat i'll quite often have a lunch break with someone and in the building now we've got artists and makers and web developers and photographers mm. and it's just a really lovely place to be and yeah. we treat each other almost like colleagues but we're not colleagues we're just kind of happen to be working in the same space and i that's love that nice. so yeah that's been one of the biggest successes of doing it um, so yeah, don't be fooled by the the large space. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's nothing being taken away from you. I think it's yeah, really great use of space. Yeah, it's very clever. Um, yeah. And also, just maybe it will encourage people to 
think a bit more creatively about like bout space and saying, can I sublet this? Can this be an yeah. alternative revenue stream that I haven't even thought of yet to yeah. subsidize it? No, I think it's yeah. cool. Um, can I ask like a really, it might just be a really super boring question, but it might be interesting when you were like just coming out of London and stuff and you were employed mm -hmm. and then making that jump to get commercial space, often people who are like landlords, they want to see something like, okay, I want to see your accounts for the last six months, or I want mm -hmm. a big fat deposit, or I want six months rent or something like, yeah. uh, how how did you guys find that? Like, it might be too personal. You don't have to say, but like, how do you finance something like that jump from going as employed to self-employed and getting commercial premises? Because it's <sighs> financially. Difficult. So, in terms of background checks, I think we were fortunate that they didn't do very many. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, there's no smoke and mirrors there. That was just like <laughs> we got lucky. Um, we have been a limited company registered for quite a long time. Oh, uh, yeah. Because okay. we had, like, we've been registered for about five years now. That's uh, good, yeah. And because when we were active, we had part-time jobs, any money that we did make kind of just sat in the business account. Like, it's, That's good. It's, yeah, so it was a relatively healthy balance, I suppose. We hadn't ever drawn down on it or paid ourselves from it. It just sat there. So if we ever wanted to invest in a new piece of equipment or whatever, we would use the money we'd work. You know, we worked for it, but we didn't really spend it unless we needed to because we were getting mm. paid salaries from other places. Um, I guess that's the beauty of having like a side hustle, isn't it? Um, so yeah, background checks didn't really exist. Um, we had some savings. So I think financially all they had... To all they requested from us was like one month, like a deposit, which was equivalent to one month's rent plus the first month's rent. Wow, and that only that's really good. like, yeah, it only really totaled like, I don't know, two or three grand, maybe. I don't know for nice. sure. But yeah, um, it wasn't so it was a big stretch that you had to get a loan out and all that type of stuff. It didn't feel like it at the time. The biggest stretch felt like the theater that ultimately, like, as soon as we sign and send this email, <laughs> we have like money coming out of the bank and this is a big space and it's costing a lot of money. Um, and right now, like we have no jobs coming in. Like we didn't have print jobs lined up and we, like I said, we sublet, we, we like signed up three people from previews. So we had th three tenants, but yeah, it was like, holy shit, this could tank. And we, cause we didn't know the area that well. Like we really had no clue whether it was going to be a success or not. Like, mm. So yeah, we we signed like we've got a five year lease on this building, and I do feel very like blessed that it's so far working out. But it it very easily could could still and could have gone a very different way. Um, but yeah, I suppose the other thing is we are in the West Country, so commercial properties are just cheaper. Yeah, not you know it's a bit of a myth to think that it's like you know, half the price or whatever. It's not Yeah, that. you're still in an industrial estate or yeah. something, I'm guessing. It's not like, some of my friends that are still in London are like, yeah, well, you know, you can get a pint of beer for £2.50 where you live. And I'm like, no, you really can't. Like, it's, yeah. uh, How it's much all... is a pint of beer in the West Country? Let's, let's do the comparisons. Oh, can... It's like between £4.50 and £5 still. Yeah, you're not drinking any shit, are you? You're drinking no, like a nice it's IPA. Like, yeah. It's all homogenous, you know, it's like everywhere yeah. now. They're all, it's like... Prices have kind of homogenized, I guess. Um, but yeah, we have definitely like lowered our outgoings. Like if we, we would not have been able to do this in London, put it that way. Like we've increased our outgoings from what we were doing before, but proportionally, like if we had tried to do something like this in London, it would have just not have been a possibility. Yeah. Um, You're seeing like, uh, well, I always forget their name. I'm really sorry. Like, so you've got Print Club London. So they do artist desks and studios and then the big art room. Yeah. Which, have have you been to that? Yeah. Have you yeah. been there? Yeah. yeah. Have you visited and like done a course and stuff? I haven't no. done a course, no, but I've no. been. I've like, they, you know, they used to do the blisters exhibitions and stuff. So ah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I went in uh, a bit incognito when I was um, fresh out of uni just to see like, uh, what their course looked like so that I could yeah. do my own course anyway. Uh, and then the other one is uh, third rail, but they've yeah. also got, what's they've the got other the, thing they've got? It's called third rail print space. That's, that's really near where I used to, where our old studio used to be. 
Yeah. Did you ever visit or did you take any inspiration from like that setup or did you take yeah, anything I guess that you wanted to do? Um, yeah, we lived really near it and our studio was really near Third Rail. Um, and the, the open access space is in a place called the Peckham Levels, which has got like bars and nights and stuff. So you, you're yeah. often around. Um, and then there's also Sun Cells Print Studio, which is yes. another open access space. And that yeah. weirdly, they're all like, you know, relatively close to each other. So maybe, yeah, maybe part of it was subconsciously like dripping, drip feeding into my mind that maybe that would be a thing. But yeah, like we know it's possible, like something yeah. is possible, but all yeah. of those people have had to diversify to some extent. And then like exactly. they, some of them are quite open about their struggles of like, guys, COVID's happened where all of our income is yeah. shriveling up in front of us. So yeah, yeah it's, it is tricky, isn't it? Getting the right balance that I know you're Yeah, and then like, you know, auditioning is still, I still am passionate about that. So I wouldn't want to just become like, ultimately a technician. Yeah. Helping other people. Like I love helping other people do and uh, sort of experience the joys of print, but I then also want to share in that, you know? So yeah, I think I want to do both maybe. Um, do you have like a little press, a little stamp for the paper? For your, uh, do it yeah, for your logo. We actually don't, no. Oh, but, you um, don't. Do you I know one, one? So this was something you were asking about business. I don't know why this this is unusual. Like I was not expecting this conversation to go down the business route because I'm not really like very good at business. Um, but going back to what you were asking about how you know how do you set up businesses and those kind of like questions for people. Are you asking also about how the temptation is to like just register loads of companies and do lots of things? And I remember like in my naivety, I just, you know, when you're young, you just, if you, you think that setting up a business is like getting a logo and a business card and then you're like, that's it. <laughs> and you're like, we, that's the first thing I did was like create this brand and I bought a stamp. I got a website URL. I made some business cards. It's and just I made, nice spending money. <laughs> yeah. And I designed a really nice logo. And then I was like, right. So what is the bit like, what's the business? <laughs> and like, you know, a business person, if they were on like, you know, with Alan Sugar, they'd have, they'd have not done all of those things. They'd have written a business plan and like sought funding and all that stuff. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, maybe from the design background, I just got totally like enamored by the idea of building a brand, but then forgot what the brand was. Yeah. It's funny though, isn't it? Because now, yeah, being the additioner is your brand because it's your craft, but also the space is your brand. And there's so many things that are coming under the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you answer the question of like, um, what is your unpopular print opinion in the print industry? And you can pick like which part of it you want. <laughs> yeah, you have I've, to been, I've been like mulling over this because I've, I've, I've been doing my research. I've listened to a lot of your episodes um, and like I love some people's responses just been so humorous. And I've been like, like well, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Disprince who said, like, his shop pack was just like, get your mum to do the printing. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was like, I'd love to come up with something really funny. But um, actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about minimum order quantities, which is yeah. a bit, but we've recently been like doing very small and quite intimate projects with local businesses. And I've come to the conclusion that like minimum order quantities are kind of an invented principle, just for the convenience of the printer. Like, yes, you're right. And I, so maybe that's not enough. Maybe that's not unpopular. Maybe it's just true. But um, well, it is. You, you're saying that minimum orders are are selfish. They're bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's, that's that's controversial. That's good. The the analogy I wanted to give was that I had a really nice conversation with a client, and they were asking about pricing of some t-shirts for a, a, their local business, and. I explained to them that after the setup and everything, it would be almost the same price relative to do like 20 as it would be to do seven, which she wanted seven. And um, her response, which was really like eye opening to me was like, I don't want 20. I want seven. I don't, the world doesn't need 13 spare t-shirts that are probably going to go in my closet for a while. And then I'll get bored of them give them to a local charity shop and they'll maybe end up in landfill. Mm. 
And it was just like, oh yeah. Like, so I felt like a, maybe that would be what I'd talk about was like the duty to be conscious about how much you're putting out into the world and only put enough. Like I explained to her, I'll print you seven, but it would almost cost you the same to get 20. And she was really like powerful in her stance that she only wanted seven and she'd be happy to pay the price for it. And I just felt as a printer, we have a responsibility. Like if we're still getting paid and mm. um, if the job's there and it's something we want to take on anyway, then as long as the as long as we get paid for our time, like why push more for someone who doesn't want more? Yeah. So yeah, that was my That's slightly good. like, <laughs> not so funny, but slightly like boring. Um, it's for more of a philosophical approach if you go there. Yeah, but, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah I, I have heard other printers struggle with the minimum order because of that type of thing. Like maybe they've only got five employees. Yeah. You know, they don't want 25 shirts. And then yeah. they've they've said things like minimum spend. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, give me minimum spend to work out. And then I've got to be like, it was just too much admin yeah. for my head and I just can't be bothered with it. So yeah. the minimum order is easy it is selfish on part of the printer i think i agree yeah but um yeah and i mean no disrespect by that because for certain no, no, people yeah there's other reasons as well like you like you said employees and you know profit and loss and running costs and all that has to be taken into account but yeah i just felt like we've always put a minimum order on our website i need to take it down i think but it just got me thinking like why why have we always done that and the answer has generally been because it's inconvenient to us to do less um but uh, you know it, as a social responsibility and like a ecological responsibility we should be questioning that and like yeah doing, doing enough but not too much i agree because then you're you're you you've got a whole yeah whole big chunk of your website is really like demonstrating that you're a small kind of like family run well you kind of like brought the family into it you mm -hmm. brought the fact that you're environmental into it and you're kind of conscious but you've also said things like we want to keep the diy ethos running through the business so you're not trying to be a big commercial yeah entity so yeah it's just like straddling that isn't it it's quite yeah mm. but i also want to be like careful like i'm not trying to you know I don't want to wade in because I've also listened to a lot of the conversations you've had with other printers about like water space versus plastisol or it's so, yeah, still interesting that organic or not organic. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And I've learned honestly, I've learned so much just from hearing other people speak. And it's really got me thinking, which is powerful. So I don't want to wade too much into it because I'm not presuming to be a like a knowledge it doesn't on matter it, it doesn't matter what other people think. what what is your what is your thing because i know you're water-based and you love perm set so why well, i think why just, I suppose my answer is like we're we're just we're sort of the, we're the best way we currently know how we're trying yes. to do things the right way yeah. but we're not perfect for sure there's still a lot to learn but we are willing to learn and we're trying to like balance the viability of a business with doing things right and yeah. that's a constant like journey that we're still on and um so if that analogy i just gave you like you know she the client taught me in that instance and i was like quite humbled by it i was like oh, okay yeah cool yeah. Like, interesting yeah. um yeah. and i'd say the same about the black because you know plastic cell versus water space there's so much so much going on there it's like the energy consumption and the water consumption and it's not just purely about like what's going into the soil it's about like what it took to make it and what it takes to cure it and how long it lasts and oh, you know there's so much on both sides so I'm just trying to like educate myself I guess I don't think there's a right I, I think this is like a really good point because I've seen this recently and it actually wound me up a little bit on someone's uh account they they weren't just saying how environmental they were they were saying how unenvironmental everyone else was yeah, and well, so this that is, they're uh, like the yeah. beacon. It's like, yeah. just shut up. Mm. Don't stop. Don't say everyone else is shit so that I'm good. <laughs> don't yeah. worry about them. Just no, ignore no. them. Just say I'm good because of these reasons. Yeah. And this is my thought on it. You don't have to bring everyone else down to. No, yeah, I just no, I, don't, I yeah. don't like that type of thing. But 
it's a, it's evolving all the time. Like even there's there's plaster links that are becoming plant based, and you're like, what? Wow, really? Can, That's yeah, mad. yeah, there yeah. are some in America. So it's like okay, and then they're putting more plastics in the water based. So they're basically just merging into one big mm. ink system anyway. So I think we just need to concentrate on like accreditations and things, and yeah. like hope that they allow us to make better choices and. Um, yeah. But yeah, also think about our own scales and I don't know. It's difficult. Uh, but I, you, yeah. You've been like talking, having these debates with so many different people recently. And I think that's like powerful because you must have like really educated yourself, but also through publishing it as a podcast, you're educating like, you know, myself and loads of other people. Mm. And yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's great. It, it's, I think it's good. It's, it's good. Like, to be having the conversation is almost like as powerful as what you're doing, isn't it? In the first place. Mm. Cause it's like, I thought discharge ink was really good because it cat- comes into the water-based category. Yeah. And then I did it and I did a six color job and then what to do with the discharge ink. Yeah. You got waste because no one can use every ounce of ink. So then I put it back in these pots. Have you ever watched discharge ink expand overnight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I came in and it was like literally blobbing on the floor because it had expanded and just gone everywhere. Yeah. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, yeah. if that was plastered, I'd scoop it up, put it in the right pots, done. But it's discharged, so it's dead after yeah. six hours. Yeah. At the end of the print run, I might have even lost a few shirts because I ran out of time because mm. I was doing it all day. And I'm like, Where's the yeah? Where's the waste coming into the into the? I don't. It's not going on the soil. For no. the soil association proof. I know that's a massive factor. I'm joking. I'm joking. But, <laughs> no, I think it's true. But yeah, but like the, um, <laughs> this is going in. What the it's, waste? It's just like a. It's like you're treading. It's yeah. like deep water, isn't it? It's like knowing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any answers really. I just think, yeah, I'm, I'm. What I would just say is that I am conscious and I'm trying, but I'm also learning at the same time. And like, we as a business are like constantly changing the way we do things, and that is through education. So yeah, uh, you know, hopefully, if we were to have this conversation again in like ten years' time, then lots of our workflows and materials would be different again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I feel like I'm just like going around, like hitting a little hornet's nest when I ask people about that. But hey, yeah, that it's... must be quite juicy. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do like what I do. I do like asking people's unpopular opinion because then uh, yeah. it gets clipped up and then, and then it gets distributed and then. Well, it was yeah. the one I was like dreading, but yeah. So mine would be about the minimum order quantities. I think it's really interesting. I haven't heard yeah. anyone else say that yet. It's kind of there's a there's another thing to that. Like, have you ever had someone come to you and they want like a memorial shirt? No, but I no. heard um, who was that was um, in America up all night was it or get a grip? They were talking yeah. about that. <laughs> That's like, but, That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was thinking about that. I've had that as well. I've had it where like this young guy's mate died, and then everyone at the funeral wanted the image on the shirt. Yeah, and I remember having that job, and I was just thinking, oh yeah, I have actually done that. But you're not going to go oh minimum order twenty five. No. If someone says, oh, it's for my mate's funeral tomorrow, you're going to be like, <laughs> shit, okay, I'll do, how many do you yeah. want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it is, it is interesting. And also yeah. there's probably loads of jobs there, which are super specialist and low quantities. That doesn't mean you're not making any money on them. You can just charge a lot more for less units to make it viable. Yeah, and I guess maybe that's a, an advantage of being a manual press as well. Like, you know, the time it takes maybe, I don't know, anything about autos but i'm guessing like the work involved in setting one up and getting it all running if you're only going to do seven shares like you would just run it on a manual Mm. um so yeah we have a kind of an opportunity to do that as well which is quite nice yeah have you have you got any um uh just to like end on something that's nice like (laughs) Have you got any like tips for things like mixing colors and uh, are you doing some of it by eye or are you mm. are you relying on panto mixing systems or like what type of oh, God, I wish I, yeah I'd love to ask more people um so most of the time definitely with paper we're doing it by eye like we're, mm. we're printing we're checking it against a sample with small swatches mixing it a bit more 
you can build recipes doing that way by measuring before and after and whatever, but ultimately it's done manually. Um, with fabrics, like we, if we're using Magna, we'll use the Magna Mix system, which is fucking incredible I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a total game changer. <laughs> and I wish that like Permacet had the same thing. In fact, I think, you know, if they're listening, like make one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a huge, for us, that's a huge draw towards using Magna. Um, yeah. So yeah, you see, they've got an automatic machine. By the way, have you seen that? I've seen yeah. it. Yeah, it's just bonkers. <laughs> like, oh, okay, you just took three hours out of my entire day. Uh, well, yeah, right. So <laughs> Rose, my partner, hasn't since we've been using Magnamix. She hasn't had an opportunity to use it, and she used to do all the mixing herself. And I remember showing her, and she was like, "You bastard!" Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I used to have to fucking slave away at this you know by hand and you would come in and tell me that it was like not quite right and make me do it all again <laughs> and now you get to just use like a recipe that's been given to you <laughs> yeah which doesn't seem fair but yeah um it is tricky um and then yeah you can also like a good tip for some people printing on papers is that you can send off like custom for, for custom inks so like screen tech will mix you an ink if you give them mm. the number. So if you know that you want a very specific colour and you want quite a lot of it, like don't spend ages wasting your time making it. Just get someone else to make it for you. Yeah. Well, if they can do that, then they've got a system. So why aren't they telling you what the system is? I don't know. Maybe they're built, maybe they're working on one. Yeah. I'm not sure. Give it to us. Like this, yeah. <laughs> that's like gonna I feel like, yeah, there's some cross-pollination between like what the textile industry has. Yeah, and then what the art world needs, and it's yeah. like if you're in both, then you can see things. You can like transfer them back and forth. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, yeah. Hit, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say I'm learning more and more about the textile world. Like at the moment, more of our work is coming from t-shirts and tote bags and that kind of thing. So I'm having not having to. I've always, you know we've been running quite a long time now, so I know it all. But I'm kind of rationing up on a lot of stuff that I haven't done in a while or improving on things that I used to do differently. And like, yeah, the, the textile world is just as much of a minefield. Like for anyone listening that is mostly textiles and isn't, and thinks like I'm talking gobbledygook when I'm talking about fabric uh, paper printing, like I feel exactly the same the <laughs> other way. Like, in fact, sometimes even more so when you start talking about like durometers and like goodness knows what and I'm just like what like yeah okay <laughs> yeah do you think I think when I moved over to the textile side the community broadened up like loads just opened up yeah. Whereas, like, yeah, when yeah. I was printing art, artwork I knew nobody I knew like the gallery owners but they're not they're not like me I can't like actually yeah have camaraderie well, I'm getting that sense as well like not by design but I've maybe been like slightly more like reserved publicly like I'm I'm not very good at social media and I don't make YouTube videos and this is the first time I've ever done a podcast so like subconsciously I guess I keep myself to myself a little bit and um but I'm learning that through listening to your podcast and looking at like problem solving by watching YouTube videos you can see that there is like a really strong community for printmakers in mm. the fabric world yeah. and you know there isn't a squeegee and ink channel for paper printing. There isn't a Ryanair for paper printing. Like no. none of that happens. This is all focused on t-shirts. So yeah, it's it's really nice to be tapping into it. Cool. Yeah. But there is a chasm there for someone who is inclined to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and has the knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks no for having me have on. a nice evening. Andrew, Cheers. take care. See you. Bye.